Welcome to the Dash 8 Q400 Systems Training Course Fuel Module. In this module, we will give an overview of the fuel system in the Q400, talk about the fuel tanks themselves and quantity measurement within the fuel tanks, and then discuss engine fuel feed. Finally, we will finish with a discussion on fuel transfer and refueling before discussing limitations and normal and abnormal procedures affecting the fueling system. Fuel for the Q400 is stored in two integral fuel tanks, one in each wing. Fuel is supplied from each wing tank to its respective engine by an ejector pump or by an AC-powered auxiliary fuel pump as a backup. The APU is also supplied with fuel from the left wing tank only. Fuel is normally supplied to both tanks through a single point pressure refueling connection located on the aft end of the right engine nacelle. Fuel can also be transferred between the two wing tanks anytime AC power is available, though there is no capability to directly cross-feed an engine from the opposite tank. In the flight deck, fuel quantity is displayed on the ED and can also be displayed on the fuel page of the MFD. Additional controls for the fuel system are located on the fuel control panel, which is at the forward end of the pedestal. Fuel for the Q400 is carried in two integral wing tanks, one in each wing. The wing tanks are located between the fore and aft spar in each wing and extend from the fuselage to the wing rib just inboard of the aileron. The combined usable fuel capacity of both fuel tanks is 11,724 pounds or 5,318 kilograms. Each wing tank is divided into three separate areas, a surge bay, the main tank, and a collector bay. The surge bay is at the outboard end of the tank between the rib adjacent to the aileron and the next inboard rib. The surge bay is separated from the rest of the tank by a wall and is used to vent the fuel tank and recover excess fuel. The surge bay is connected to the main tank by two float valves and a vent line. The float valves close as the main tank fills, so fuel cannot enter the surge tank from the main tank. But fuel that ends up in the surge bay can flow back into the main tanks when the fuel level in the main tanks drops. The vent line is located at the top of the main tank and mainly vents fuel vapors into the surge bay as the tanks fill and allows air into the tanks as they empty. Two standpipes in the surge bay are connected to NACA anti-icing vents located under the wing and allow air in or out of the surge bay as the fuel level in the main tank rises and falls. The collector bay is located at the inboard aft corner of the main tank. The purpose of the collector bay is to ensure the engine is always supplied with fuel regardless of airplane attitude and quantity available in the main fuel tank. The collector bay wall contains a number of flapper valves which open to allow fuel into the collector bay from the main tank, but close when the level in the main tank falls, keeping the fuel in the collector bay. Additionally, a number of scavenge pumps collect fuel from various low points in the main tank and transfer it further inboard towards the collector bay. The scavenge pumps are ejector pumps that are powered by a high pressure fuel that is returned from the engine fuel system. Ejector pumps use a source of high-speed, high-pressure fuel that creates suction within the pump and sucks additional fuel along to the destination. Ejector pumps are used because they require practically no maintenance as they have no moving parts. All of these valves and scavenge pumps exist to ensure the collector bay is full of fuel at all times until the main tank is completely empty. The quantity of fuel in the tank is normally determined using nine capacitance-type probes located throughout each fuel tank. A fuel quantity computer takes in signals from the nine probes and translates it into a fuel mass for each tank that is displayed on the bottom of the ED and also on the fuel page of the MFD. An additional readout is also available on the refueling panel. The readout will be in pounds or kilograms depending upon how the aircraft is configured. The system is also calibrated to only show the usable fuel within each tank. A single magnet stick or magnetic dipstick is located on the underside of each main tank and provides a backup system for determining fuel quantity when the electronic system is unavailable. The temperature in degrees Celsius in each fuel tank is displayed on the fuel page of the MFD. The sensor for the fuel tank temperature is located in the left collector bay. Additionally, the temperature of the fuel as it exits the fuel oil heat exchanger is displayed on the ED. Normally it is displayed in white but changes to yellow or red if the temperature is outside of limits. Finally, a number one or number two tank fuel low caution light will come on anytime the following conditions are met. The parking brake is off, the corresponding engine is operating, and the corresponding collector bay has a fuel level below approximately 305 pounds. 
Note that it is possible to get spurious tank fuel low caution lights during the engine start process. These may be ignored during the engine start process and usually occur when the airplane has arrived at the gate with a fairly low fuel level, less than a thousand pounds per wing. Even though the airplane was refueled, fuel does not begin flowing into the collector bay in a big way until the scavenge pumps are working at full speed, which requires the engine fuel pump to be turning, which only starts when the engine is starting. If these happen, they should go away very quickly once the fuel starts flowing. The primary purpose of the fuel system is to ensure a continuous supply of fuel to the engines at all times. Part of this is accomplished by the design of the fuel tanks, which are designed to keep the collector bay full at all times, even when the rest of the tank is nearly empty and at all aircraft attitudes. From the collector bay, fuel is fed to the engines by a primary ejector pump or an auxiliary AC electric pump. Like the scavenge ejector pumps, this ejector pump is powered by mode of fuel flow returned from the engine. The primary ejector pump is the normal source of fuel pressure for the engine, with the electric fuel pump serving as a backup system for takeoff, landing, and in case of a failure of the primary ejector pump. If the pressure at the inlet of the engine-driven fuel pump drops below the required limits, this will eliminate the number one or number two engine fuel press caution light. Each tank aux pump is powered by AC electric power and is controlled by a switch light on the fuel control panel on the console. The status of the tank aux pumps can be verified on the fuel page of the MFD or by the illumination of the tank aux pump switch light. A sensor measures fuel pressure on the output side of the pump and will only illuminate the switch light and show on the MFD when the output pressure is high enough to indicate the pump is running properly. Each engine has a fuel shutoff valve located in the fuel line as it enters the nacelle. The fuel shutoff valve is controlled by the corresponding red pull fuel hide off handle, also known as the T-handle, located on the fire protection panel. The valve is normally open at all times. The status of each valve can be checked on the fire protection panel as well. White light for closed, green light for open. Prior to entering the engine driven fuel pump, the fuel passes through a filter and then a fuel oil heat exchanger, or FOHE. The filter has a bypass switch, which opens if the filter is clogged, allowing fuel to continue to flow. If the filter is approaching or reaches the bypass condition, the number one or number two fuel filter bypass caution light will illuminate. The fuel oil heat exchanger helps to cool engine oil while also helping to reheat the fuel tanks. Keep in mind that the engine is always supplied with more fuel than is needed by the fuel system. The excess is then routed back to the fuel tank as motor flow for the ejector pumps. This returning fuel serves to warm the fuel in the tanks to ensure it is kept well above the freezing point at cruising altitudes. Fuel can be transferred between the left and right wing tanks by use of the fuel transfer system. Note that fuel does not crossfeed into the opposite engine, but in a fuel transfer, fuel is simply dumped into the other tank. Each engine can only be fed by fuel in its respective fuel tank. The fuel transfer system is used primarily to fix a fuel imbalance or manage fuel, especially during single engine operations. With an engine shut down, the remaining engine is usually running at high power settings and a large fuel imbalance can grow very quickly. When the fuel transfer system is activated, using the fuel transfer switch, two fuel transfer shutoff valves open to allow the fuel to flow between the tanks. The auxiliary fuel pump on the donor tank is also automatically activated, regardless of the tank aux pump switch position, to force fuel from the donor through to the recipient tank. Note that each fuel transfer pipe also has a separate level control shutoff valve. These valves close when an overfill condition is sensed in the fuel tank, thus terminating a fuel transfer before fuel is vented overboard. The status of the fuel transfer is best monitored on the fuel page of the MFD. The status of the fuel transfer shutoff valves are both indicated on this page and the tank aux pump status also illuminates on this page. Anytime a fuel transfer is in progress, the fuel page should be left up on one of the MFDs as a reminder. Otherwise, it is easy to forget that a fuel transfer is in progress and end up transferring way too much fuel. Refueling can be accomplished through an overwing fuel cap on each wing. However, fueling is normally accomplished through a single point pressure refueling panel located on the underside of the aft end of the right engine nacelle. Anytime this refueling panel is open, a fueling on caution light will illuminate. As an interesting sidebar, this is the only caution light on the caution warning panel that does not trigger the single chime or the master caution light. As well as having the actual fueling hose connection, this panel has a number of lights and switches to allow control and monitoring of the refueling process. The total quantity requested can be entered on this panel and the refueling will automatically terminate when the requested level is reached. The refueling system uses the same plumbing as the fuel transfer system. 
Both tanks are filled through the same pipes as are used for a fuel transfer. And if a specific fuel quantity is pre-selected on the refueling panel, each level control shutoff valve will close when that tank reaches half of the pre-selected fuel, thus ensuring the fuel tanks are balanced at the end of each fueling. Since refueling is automatically ordered through the Majestic control panel, we will not describe the refueling panel any further. For those who are curious, the refueling panel does support defueling as well. Fuel can be sucked from the tanks through the pressure refueling connection. Again, not really relevant to Majestic Q400 pilots. There are a few important limitations for all Q400 pilots to be aware of when it comes to the fueling system. The maximum fuel imbalance during flight is 600 pounds. If this limit is exceeded, the ED will flash an amber fuel imbalance message until the fuel imbalance is rectified. Additionally, the tank ox pumps must be on for takeoff and landing. This ensures an uninterrupted source of fuel during critical phases of flight should a problem occur with the primary ejector pumps. During flight away from the ground, the pumps are normally selected off to minimize wear unless they are required. Finally, continuous operation with the fuel oil heat exchanger outlet temperature below 0 degrees Celsius or above 71 degrees Celsius is prohibited. Once a cold engine is started, the warming oil and recirculating fuel usually raises the temperature of the fuel well above 0 degrees very quickly. In the summer, especially during prolonged ground running, it is possible for the fuel heater outlet temperature to easily exceed 71 degrees Celsius. If this occurs, consult the QRH and perform the abnormal fuel temperature checklist. During normal use of the fuel system, there are very few actions to perform. The tank ox pumps must be selected on prior to takeoff and landing, and selected off again afterwards. Additionally, the fuel quantity should be periodically monitored throughout the flight and fuel transfers conducted whenever appropriate. There are only a few abnormalities associated with the fuel system on the Q400. As always, follow the appropriate checklist. If either the number 1 or number 2 tank fuel low caution light comes on, this indicates the related collector bay contains less than 305 pounds of fuel. As mentioned before, if this occurs during engine start on the ground, it may be initially disregarded, once the engine-driven pump begins turning and supplying motive flow back to the scavenge ejectors, the collector bay will be filled quickly. Should either caution light come on during flight, the checklist will consider the possibility of a fuel leak. A fuel leak will lead to an engine shutdown to reduce the fire hazard associated with a fuel leak. If no leak is suspected, the tanks can be rebalanced using the fuel transfer system. If there is plenty of fuel indicated in the tank, which is showing the tank fuel low caution light, then the fuel is not being transferred into the collector bay properly. Keeping the wings level and turning on the tank ox pump will help encourage fuel to flow into the collector bay. If either the number one or number two engine fuel press caution light illuminates during flight, this indicates low fuel pressure at the engine. Activating the tank ox pump should supplement what may be a defective primary ejector pump. However, if the low pressure is caused by a local fuel leak, then an engine shutdown will again be required. The most common fuel system abnormality you will likely encounter is simply an abnormal fuel temperature. This often occurs in the summer during hot ambient conditions while idling on the ground or operating at high power settings during initial climb out. The solution is to turn on the related tank ox pump to increase the fuel flow through the fuel oil heat exchanger, thus diluting the excess heat through more fuel. The pump may be left on as long as necessary without limitations. Once cooler air is reached at higher altitudes, the pump can usually be turned back off again. This concludes the current module. We will now conduct a brief review. I suggest you prepare to pause the video as each question is displayed and attempt to answer it yourself before the correct answer is revealed. Let's begin.
This concludes the current module. I hope you found this information useful. Please ask any questions you may have in the comments section below. And please subscribe to the channel to be alerted when more modules are complete. Thank you for watching.